He is the brand new Al Maghrib Institute instructor. His course that he's going to be teaching, inshallah, is the concise version of Sahih Muslim. He's a student of knowledge who graduated from the Islamic University in Jordan, and he's been studying hadith for you know a very long time. And so, why he's so interesting, I feel, is because he's grown up in the West. He's born and raised in Michigan, in the USA, and he has a good context of the young Western Muslims' lifestyle and understanding. And he's mixing that and infusing that with his classical Islamic teaching. We're going to be introducing that instructor right now. This is a great new lineup to the instructor family. Al Maghrib is growing internationally. Uh, so many more places, new cities opening up, and we want to continually evolve, bringing new instructors, young, fresh talent that we can bring to great stages and platforms just like this. So, without further ado, I want to invite our dean of academics, Sheikh Yasser Qadi. Dr. Sheikh Yasser Qadi to come and give us an insight into this new instructor because this is a very special important time so Sheikh take it away inshallah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh It's my honor to announce the newest uh, Al Maghrib instructor and alhamdulillah I've known this instructor for a number of years and as soon as I first met him uh, I saw in him a, a, a talent, I saw in him a potential. Uh, Alhamdulillah, this newest instructor uh, memorized the Quran at a young age. He got the ijazat necessary for the Quran recitation. He started studying with his local ulama and mashayikh. Uh, and then he went overseas to Jordan and he attained a master's in Islamic fiqh. All of this stuff you're going to read in the biography and, and you're going to hear all of this. Uh, but subhanAllah, uh, the instructor that uh, we're going to introduce and announce, I know him personally because I invited him to my community to lead Salat al-Taraweeh uh, for the month of Ramadan. Every year it's my responsibility to find somebody to lead the, the Taraweeh and I'm very very picky I want somebody who has a beautiful voice alhamdulillah I want somebody who uh, can really show us the spirit of uh, the Quran to Im impersonify to embody the characteristics and traits of uh, the true alim and imam uh, and uh, this is the brother that came to my mind for that year and alhamdulillah he came and he proved to be the best hit of ever in our community for Salat al-Taraweeh we tried to get him over and over again but he became so popular that he never came back to our community but in Inshallah, we're still hoping to get him uh, soon, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, there's just one thing that really hurt me when I found out. His philosophy of desserts is totally wrong. I'm disappointed to tell you. Because you see, there's only one manhab, madhab. There's only one madhab in desserts. And that's my madhab, ice cream. Okay? If you like ice cream, you're a good guy. Unfortunately, our next instructor does not like ice cream. Instead... He is into the madhab of chocolates. What? Really? Seriously? You like that? <laughs> chocolates is a secondary madhab, only after ice cream. Nonetheless, I'm willing to forgive him if you can all help me in welcoming our newest instructor, Sheikh Suleiman Hani from Detroit, Michigan. Imam Suleiman Hani is a lecturer and author hailing from Dearborn, Michigan. At the age of 14, he completed a 10-month Qur'an memorization program and shortly after began his intensive studies, gaining ijazat in the six books of hadith from multiple scholars, as well as a Master of Arts degree from the University of Jordan's College of Sharia, ranking first in his class. Suleiman has served as an Imam and Youth Director since the age of 19, lectured at conferences and workshops around the globe, authored numerous books and articles, and has recorded several comprehensive series with some of the largest Islamic TV stations worldwide. Anytime we go through any type of difficulty, any type of pain, to remember not just these reasons, but that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching over you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is planning for you better than you plan for yourself. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Amongst the most important questions for all of us to reflect on, for all of us to assess ourselves with, a component and a key to happiness, a component to progress in life, is the question, who am I? When you're asked by others, who are you? 
generally the response identifies with your nationality, your name, your ethnicity. A few years ago, a brother said he was from Scotland, and so I regretfully made the mistake of responding to him by saying, perhaps I'm from Scotland too. And as you laughed, he looked at me and, and it looked like I had just committed the worst crime of the year, and I did by attempting the accent. But it goes back to the question of who are you? And how often do you stop and contemplate in this busy, fast-paced life and ask yourself, truly, who am I? In this short talk, we want to address three questions. The first is, why should we invest our time and our energy and our effort in trying to know more deeply and properly who we truly are? The second is, how can we practically do so? And the third is, how can knowing oneself help us to better know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As for the why, there are many reasons amongst them. Knowing oneself is a key to true happiness. Contentment in the heart that you cannot find anywhere else. You cannot find in material wealth or pursuits of desires. And oftentimes we must ask ourselves, what really makes me happy? One time a brother shouted out from the audience, he said, marriage. I said, mashallah, may Allah put barakah in your marriage. How long have you been married? He said, I'm not married yet. <laughs> He's married now, alhamdulillah. So what truly makes you happy? Amongst the benefits of knowing oneself is less inner conflict. We find many times that if you grow up in a Muslim family and you're focused only on the external rituals, without anything internal motivating you, then the actions become void, they become superficial, they become empty. And that gap leaves an inner conflict. And at times when there's hardship, the inner conflict becomes a problem. Amongst the benefits of knowing oneself is that we have more resilience in our identity. Rather than falling for every fad and phase and ideology and ism that comes and goes and rises and falls, we find that the one who is rooted in their belief system, the one who has conviction in who they truly are, regardless of external pressures, regardless of peer pressure, regardless of societal pressure, because you know yourself, you are resilient. Amongst the benefits of knowing oneself, we find that it leads to an increase in comprehensive tranquility and the ability to understand and reach out to others, the ability to serve others, the ability to coexist and live in harmony with others. And we follow in the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who exemplified this throughout his life. And most importantly, we find that knowing oneself leads to truly knowing our Lord Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And there are massive and un limited benefits in that. One of the benefits someone raised earlier today, actually, it was actually Buna, may Allah reward him, is that knowing oneself leads to better decision making in all facets of life. Your decisions are a reflection of who you truly are. For example, how many people here are iPhone users? It's okay, don't be shy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide you back to Android, it's okay. <laughs> We all make mistakes, but knowing oneself helps us to make better decisions. For those of you who get offended easily, I'm kidding. So please, don't take that to heart. As for the second question, how? How can we practically learn to know ourselves? If you do not reflect frequently on self-assessment, self-reflection, self-introspection, self-analysis, self-accountability, if you don't frequently contemplate on who you are in an honest manner, when your life is generally going through ease, then you'll find that if tragedy or calamity strikes, it will cause more problems and more pain, magnified, compared to the one who knows who he or she truly is. When you're alone, the greatest concern is for a person to wear a mask in private, 
It's easy to wear a mask in public. It's easy to have a reputation framed a certain way online. But who are you in private? If you're wearing a mask even with yourself, then there is cause for concern. We need to be honest with ourselves about who we truly are so that we can open the doors to progress, to improvements in all facets of life. I want to share with you a story that really moved me. A story from a brother in the United States. Three years into his marriage, he received news that his wife died in a tragic car accident. May Allah have mercy on her. She left behind her husband and their one-year-old daughter, Aya. This brother became so depressed. He could not cope with anything in life. He said he started crying every time he would see his daughter remembering his wife. He started to question decree and fate. He started to question Allah's mercy. He started questioning, how could Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take away my wife? What did I do that's so terrible? Why do I have to suffer in this way? The brother said he became so depressed that eventually he called his sister and asked her to raise his daughter, Aya. And so within the span of a few months, as his wife abruptly left his world, so too did his daughter. And not only till later did he realize, in hindsight, that had she remained in his life, she would have been a source of happiness for him, a source of optimism. Let's pause for a moment from the story. How can we truly know ourselves so that if tragedy strikes or if your life is going through ease, you're able to identify that there is real progress because you know who you truly are? There are many different questions, but for the sake of time, we'll address a few. The first, ask yourself, what do you really value? What you value is not what you write on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. What you value is not what you claim. What you value is your actions. From the time that you wake up to the time that you sleep, everything that is in between and the sleep itself, all of these actions reflect who we truly are, what we truly value. Another question we should ask ourselves, if money was no concern, how would you live your life? What would you do differently? For many people, their focus is on living for themselves. Would you live for the sake of others, to serve others, to serve Allah? What would you do with your time if you never ever had to work again? This question helps us know more about ourselves. Another question we should ask ourselves. If fear of failure was no longer a thing in your life, if you never had fear of failure, what would you pursue or who would you be? Studies show that amongst the greatest obstacles to massive potential and progress and success and unlimited legacies in this world is the fear of failure. And this is a reality that affects our ummah as well. Just looking at the number of people in this room, if we envisioned the absolute disappearance of fear from our lives in terms of failure, the amount of progress and improvements and legacies and projects and goodness that would spread in this world is immeasurable. The amount of good that would come about from pursuing your goals, your dreams, your objectives, all for the sake of Allah, because you no longer fear the concept of failure, the image or the perception of failure. If you can leave this conference today, with a little less fear of failure and a little more courage and reliance upon Allah in pursuing those goals, those dreams for His sake alone, then inshallah we will find an abundance of progress and happiness in our lives. And the most important question, the most important question, if you want to know who you truly are in a very practical, realistic way, ask yourself now, what is your life mission? It should be concise bold, explicit. What is your destination? Imagine, if you will, going to the airport and as you get to the counter, they ask you, where are you traveling to? And you say, I don't know. You're asked again, sir, ma'am, where are you traveling to? Where's your destination? I don't know. How can you embark on a journey and not know where you're headed? When you embark on a journey, you need to know your destination. 
You need to know the route to your destination, the detours that will take you away from that path. You need to know what types of friends will help you and what types of people will stop you or slow you down. When you embark on a journey, you need to know what provisions and sustenance you need in order to reach your destination successfully. If your destination is Jannah, if your life mission is to please Allah and to know and worship Allah, then all of our actions 24-7, the worldly actions as well, all of these actions are stepping stones to the ultimate life mission, to the ultimate destination. Think if you will about the people who live for this life and they make this world their paradise. There's no doubt they're disappointed often. They're feeling pain often. Why? Because if you are looking for a perfect spouse and perfect children and a perfect job and a perfect house and a perfect car, if you're looking for perfection in everything in this life, you are going to be disappointed. What you're looking for is paradise. So work for it. What you're looking for is Jannah. This life has its purpose and its purpose is not paradise. Going back to the story of the brother, Abu Ayah. Within the span of a few months, he had quit his job, became more depressed, started contemplating suicide, started drinking, stopped praying completely, isolated himself from the community, his friends and anyone who knew him. And he said, as he sat in his living room one night, seriously contemplating suicide, he was browsing through his phone between the messages between him and his wife before she passed away. And as he browsed and browsed and browsed and became more sad, he reached an exchange of messages from months earlier in which he had done some favor for his wife. So she said, I don't know what I'd do without you. I think I'd die of depression. And then immediately she followed up with it. LOL, just kidding. What I think is more depressing is the idea of not being in Jannah together. His response to her at the time was, wow, what a dark thought, LOL. May Allah unite us and our children in Jannah. And she said, Ameen. Some of you said Ameen as well. He started crying. He started bawling. He fell into the ground and started making dua as he was crying. He said he found himself in this state for a while. And eventually he got up, he purified himself and he prayed for the first time in months. And he prayed and he prayed. He said that prayer was perhaps the greatest prayer of his life. He hadn't felt such tranquility, such happiness, such peace in his heart in a long time. And he asked Allah for resilience. He asked Allah for forgiveness. He asked Allah for guidance. And most importantly, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow him to be with his wife and his children in paradise or his daughter in paradise. And that very same day, the brother called his sister and informed her that he would pick up his daughter. And he did. Now the brother is active in his community. And this is not his actual name. He's active in his community trying to help people cope with hardships, cope with suffering, studying and understanding more of who are we really? And what do you do when calamity strikes? Think if you will, imagine a person who goes through this life and it's constant misery, constant hardship, no relief whatsoever. Imagine all of our struggles combined in this room, magnified by a hundred for an entire lifetime. If you want hope in terms of your destination of paradise, then reflect on just one part of this hadith. Imam Muslim reports that the Prophet وسلم, informed us, and every time you hear his name وسلم, informed us what is translated and paraphrased as the following, that the person of this life who is going to enter paradise, a person of Jannah, who lived through this life with more misery and hardship than anyone else, on the day of judgment they are dipped one dip into paradise. And Allah asks, O son of Adam, have you ever experienced any hardship? Have you ever experienced any misery? Imagine the response of a person who lived for 70 years or 100 years and their entire life was pain, was misery, was hardship. How would you respond with all of this emotional baggage? 
But because of that one dip into paradise, he responds, No, my Lord, by Allah, I have never experienced any hardship. I have never experienced any misery. One dip into paradise is worth every ounce of patience in this life. One dip into paradise erases all pain and struggles and hardships and anxiety and stress that was experienced in this world. If that's one dip, what would a minute feel like? What would an hour feel like? What would a year feel like? The people of Jannah are there forever, never expelled from it, never feeling pain or sadness again, never having trials or tribulations. It's worth it to be patient, not for a dip into Jannah, but for an eternity. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on your destination. No matter what happens in your life, especially through times of ease, keep your focus on paradise. When we talk about the purpose of our existence and we talk about the purpose of, for example, our ears or our hearing, our eyes, our sight, we must realize that ultimately everything created for us has its purpose. Allah did not create it aimlessly. Your heart has a purpose. And the purpose of the heart is to know its creator and to connect to its creator in the ways that he revealed to us. And we think of the times in life in which our hearts felt peace and the times in life in which our hearts were distanced from Allah. We're feeling void of happiness. No matter how much wealth you have in this world, how successful you are, your material external being will not define your state of happiness. The state of the heart, when it is connected to its creator and its purpose is fulfilled properly, it attains a tranquility and a peace and a happiness that you cannot find anywhere else in this world because there is no other way to fulfill that purpose. And Allah reminds us of this. And He reminds us of this link. <laughs> Those who believe and their hearts are assured, their hearts are at peace through the remembrance of Allah. In the heart, on the tongue, in your actions, your lifestyle. Verily, indeed, unquestionably, in the remembrance of Allah do the hearts find tranquility. Do the hearts find peace. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to link our hearts to their true purpose and to allow us to live a life of peace and happiness. Therefore, this brings us to the third point. When you know the purpose of your existence and the purpose of your heart and why we breathe, why we are beating now in this world, why we are walking upon this earth, why our consciousness exists, when we reflect on that purpose and we acknowledge the truth, then we can know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can never, should never go back. For the truth has been made clear. The sweetness of faith is tasted. And the reality is knowing Allah is the most important thing in our lives because it is a lifelong journey. In this life and in the next. The greatest blessing of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the reward for the people of Jannah who are enjoying everything of paradise. And then they find the greatest reward of paradise is their meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah to make all of us and our loved ones amongst those who are meeting Allah in the highest levels of paradise. Knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today should cause all of us in this room to purify our hearts from any ill vices or grudges or feelings towards others. To forgive those who wronged us, as difficult as it may be. Knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly and fully should cause us in this room to not leave here today except with the intention to vow to purify our hearts from anything ill and our habits from anything that is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should cause us today to rectify our manners, our character with everyone. Muslims and non-Muslims, old and young, friend or foe. 
knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should cause us to purify our time, your greatest blessing in this world for his sake. And most importantly, knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly and fully should cause us to reference him and think of him throughout the day and night in everything that we do. Because ultimately we live and we die for his sake. We live and we die for his sake. And the reason we think of this, the reason we reference him is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater. And we say this many times a day, from the east to the west, billions of times a day, morning and night, every type of Muslim from every walk of life, every language and ethnicity, every single day we say, Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater. Allahu Akbar, a phrase which should cause us to realize and remember and acknowledge who we truly are. We are humble slaves and servants to the Creator. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater. Allahu Akbar, a phrase which does not or should not cause destruction or chaos, but rather a phrase that acknowledges our true purpose for existence in this world. Allahu Akbar is a phrase that allows us to be humble and in awe of who our Creator is, to reflect on His majesty. It is not a phrase which we should allow to be hijacked by any propaganda, by any organization or any individual or any movement or any institution. Allahu Akbar is a phrase that we repeat many times a day and we are proud of it. In fact, say it with me, Allahu Akbar. Louder, Allahu Akbar. Louder, Allahu Akbar. Allah indeed is greater. My dear brothers and sisters, my closing advice, don't leave this conference or this gathering. Don't leave this conference or this gathering without renewed dedication, motivation, to learn more about yourself so you can better know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so you can better serve His creation. Don't leave this conference except with less fear of failure and more reliance upon Allah. Don't leave this conference except with renewed motivation and resilience in your identity as a believer in this day and age. And don't compromise on your identity, your principles, your values for anyone or anything because Allahu Akbar, because Allah is greater. Don't leave this conference except with the intention to continue to learn, to seek knowledge, for knowledge is power. Knowledge is light, and that knowledge, that light, and that power will benefit you and the people who you come across in life. And lastly, don't leave this conference except with the new habit, the ability to contemplate frequently, day and night, on the question we asked in the very beginning. Not in my terrible Scottish accent, but rather the question that requires serious contemplation. Who am I? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us, protect us, and increase us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who truly know themselves so they can truly know their Lord. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the ever-forgiving. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the oft-forgiving, the ever-merciful to forgive all of our sins today, the major and the minor, the public and the private, the ones that we remember and the ones that we forgot. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he gathered us here today to reunite us in the highest levels of paradise. Wa salli Allahumma ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.